A few days ago I was thinking about my school days and I remembered that on just a very few occasions uh, when the weather was perhaps really inclement or maybe it was that they didn't have enough staff to go around we wouldn't be able to do PE outside and so we'd have to spend that period in a classroom with a PE teacher who wasn't used to classroom teaching and they would have to try and teach us for that time period. You won't be surprised to learn I don't remember many of those lessons but one that I do remember uh, stands out quite a lot. I don't remember the teacher's name anymore but I do remember what he told us and what he told us was this. Paul McCartney isn't really Paul McCartney. Did you know that? Paul McCartney really isn't Paul McCartney. This teacher told us that the real Paul McCartney had died in a fatal car crash in 1966, I think, or something like that. And uh, because the Beatles were very popular at that time and were obviously making lots of money, the band's management decided to replace Paul with a lookalike so that the band could continue. He cited lots of evidence for this. I don't remember all of it, but a couple that I do remember is that if you have a look at the album cover to the Beatles at Abbey Road, you'll spot that Paul is the only one of the Beatles who is walking on a black stripe on the zebra crossing. All the others are walking on white stripes. He also told us that if you play the end of the Strawberry Fields Forever single on a record player backwards, then you hear the words, Paul is dead, long live Paul. There was all sorts of other evidence as well. Being the gullible teenagers that we are, we took all this in and the news quickly spread around the school and around our families as well. But of course, it's conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theories are everywhere. After all, do you know who really shot JFK? And did you know that the moon landings didn't really happen in 1969? They were staged in some Hollywood studio somewhere you can tell by the way the flags are waving or something. Or did Elvis really die in 1977 or did he stage his own death so that he could get some privacy? There are even conspiracy theories that say that the whole of the 9-11 uh, attack, terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in New York was staged by the US government. Conspiracy theories are everywhere. Why are they so popular? Well, the human mind wants to try and make sense of the world around us. We, we, we want things in order. We want, we want to be able to understand things. But there are just some things in the world that don't make sense. That need to understand the world around us is what drives uh, our quest for, for making scientific breakthroughs. It's what is the basis of our, our legal arguments, our legal system and debates and discussions. But unfortunately, it's also the foundation for conspiracy theories, especially when what we're trying to make sense of doesn't actually make sense. The same is true of our faith. Faith is a mystery of the heart. It's something that has to be felt, but our, but our mind wants to make sense of it or wants to think it through. And so even around faith, there are conspiracy theories. Our minds want to make sense of what we don't make sense of. Nowhere is that more true than in the event that we celebrated last Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if there's one thing that we all know about the human condition, it's this. Death comes to us all and death is permanent. And so for Jesus to come along and to, to rise from the dead and to say, actually, death is not the end. Here I am again. I've risen from the dead. Our, our brains just can't compute that. And so conspiracy theories have grown up even around the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, the Gospels record one of the very earliest ones. If you have a look at Matthew chapter 28, you'll see that the very first conspiracy theory about the resurrection of Jesus began to circulate around Jerusalem, that the disciples had somehow managed to get past the Roman guard, break into the tomb, carry Jesus' body away, hide it somewhere in the city, and then tell everybody that he had been raised from the dead. There was another ancient conspiracy theory around that said that the disciples were so full of grief for all that had happened during Holy Week and especially Good Friday as Jesus was nailed to the cross and their hopes and their dreams died with him, that they suffered some kind of mass hallucination that meant that they all saw 
the ghost of Jesus. Perhaps the conspiracy theory around the resurrection that's uh, kept the most traction and, and is still around today and was um, last uh, told in the book uh, by Hugh Schoenfeld called The Passover Plot is this ancient uh, swoon theory. This is the theory that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. What actually happened was that he became unconscious. And then when he was taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb with the spices and wrapped in the linen cloth, they somehow uh, helped to heal his wounds. And then the damp cold of the tomb revived him from his coma and he was able to escape and to pretend that he'd been raised from the dead. I don't know about you, but I can pick a few holes in that particular conspiracy theory. In fact, I can probably drive a coach and horses through it. First of all, the, the soldiers who were around the cross, who would have been very experienced in this form of torture, uh, all agreed that he was dead. In fact, to make sure, they plunged a spear into his side. There is no evidence anywhere that any human being ever managed to survive crucifixion and let alone all the torture that Jesus went through before he was nailed to the cross. The Bible does tell us that jo Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus buried Jesus with over a hundred pounds of spices and then wrapped him tightly in linen as was the Jewish custom of the time. And what we're expected to believe is that uh, Jesus, unconscious, comes to in the damp cold of the tomb, somehow manages to unwrap all this linen wrapping and get rid of the hundred pounds of spices and then uh, take the time to lay them out neatly so that whoever comes into the tomb first sees them laying in a particular way and then single-handedly manages to roll open the stone to the tomb, uh, avoid the crack Roman guard that's waiting outside and then spend the rest of Resurrection Sunday pretending to be a ghost to all of his followers. It doesn't really compute, does it? But our minds need evidence of what God is asking us to believe. Over 2,000 years have passed since the first resurrection and yet the resurrection has yet to be disproved. And the Gospels are there, the first four books of the New Testament are there to help us to believe. Right at the end of our passage this morning, John says in verse 31, these are written, these words are written, so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. John says that the Gospels are written to give us evidence for Christ, but, but more than that, to actually bring us to faith in Christ. There is no doubt that as human beings, we need evidence for what we're asked to believe. That was just as true of the first disciples. At the beginning of our passage, we, we see the disciples locked in their room in Jerusalem, afraid of the Jewish authorities, and, and they've received the reports of Mary Magdalene and Peter and John, who've been to the tomb, and have come back to say, Jesus is alive, just as he said he was going to be. Jesus is alive. For those who hadn't been to the tomb, they must have been trying to work out whether this was really true. Is it true, or... or or are Mary and Peter and John involved in some kind of conspiracy theory? Perhaps they're so overcome with grief that they've seen what they've wanted to see and they believe that they've seen the risen Jesus, but it's not really true. And when you stop to think about it, there's no point blaming the disciples for needing that evidence. Resurrection shouldn't be believed. It's so beyond our comprehension that we should have doubts about it. Can a man really come back from the dead? That, that goes against all that we know about death. Each one of the disciples needed to see Jesus. Quite often we single out Thomas. In fact, we call him Thomas the Doubter and point, it, point him out for his doubt. But actually all of the disciples doubted. They all needed to see Jesus, to see the wounds in his hands and the wound in his side before they believed. But that's not really that much of a surprise. Our faith is a, a physical faith. It's a faith that needs to be based on evidence. This is the way that Dr. Joseph R. Dongle puts it. 
if the water turned to wine was drunk, the bread from heaven eaten, and the man returned from the dead unwrapped by human hands, why should the resurrected Jesus not be touched by an inquiring disciple? Since the disciples had claimed that a real, physical resurrection had indeed occurred, it's difficult to fault Thomas, or indeed any of the others, for asking to verify it by physical means. Thomas and the other disciples simply wanted to make sense of something that made no sense. But when Thomas and the other disciples see Jesus, and they see the evidence of the wounds in his hands and the wounds in his side, then Thomas gives one of the clearest statements of faith in the New Testament. Have a look at verses 28 and 29. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. What a statement of faith that is. But Jesus responds by saying to him in verse 29, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now, if we take those words at faith value, it seems as though Jesus is saying in this response that, that, that what is needed is blind faith with, with no evidence. Simply say that you believe without seeing me. That Jesus seems to be saying that, that having doubts and um, wanting to find visible, tangible or, or historical evidence of the stories about me in the Gospels is somehow bad. But that isn't what John tells us. Have a look at the passage again. Notice that Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas for his doubts, for his questions. Indeed, Jesus actually says, review the evidence. I understand. Review the evidence. Put your finger here, he says. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my sight. And he'd shown the other disciples the same. Now, if Jesus was really saying that faith is about hearing and not seeing, not having evidence, simply believing, then why would he have said that to Thomas? Secondly, as I said a little bit earlier, the whole purpose of John's Gospel is to present the miraculous signs that Jesus did in his life, including being raised from the dead, so that you may continue to believe. John is suggesting here that genuine faith is based on what others have seen and reported as truth, and which we can examine as evidence. Thirdly, it's, it's evident through this Bible reading, this Bible passage that we have read this morning, that salvation for the whole world is based on people coming to believe in Jesus, based on the witness of the original disciples, based on what we find in the Gospels, people who had seen and experienced his ministry firsthand. It's clear that John and the other disciples feel that the following generations, including our own, would hear and believe what these witnesses had heard and believed and would come to faith through what their evidence, through their witness. What this passage shows us is that what Thomas needed most was assurance. What he needed was to make sense of what made no sense. Assurance that the person who stood in their midst with the wounds in his hands and in his side was the same person who had gathered them together in the first place. Was the resurrected Jesus really who he said he was? Thomas came to be assured that the risen one is indeed the crucified one and he was filled with faith and hope. My Lord and my God he proclaims. We can be assured of the same thing. Many of us have doubts about our faith. If we're honest, we have questions that we want to ask. Sometimes we can even be tempted to fall for some of the conspiracy theories. But this passage shows us that Jesus doesn't condemn us. He knows that some people have doubt, some people have questions before they come to faith. What he comes to us and says is the words that we see in verse 26 and in one or two of the other verses as well. Eight days later, the disciples were gathered together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. For those of you who have doubts, for those of you who have questions, 
he says, peace be with you. We all have doubts. We all have questions. It's what we do with those doubts and those questions that really matters. If our doubts lead to questions and those questions lead to answers and those answers lead to an acceptance of faith, well, then doubt has done good work in our lives. But if doubts and questions lead us to stubbornness and that stubbornness leads us to a particular lifestyle that goes against God's will, well, then our faith has been harmed by those doubts and those questions. So when we have doubts, when we have questions, let's ensure that we allow those to to deepen our faith, to deepen our connection with Jesus when we search for those answers. This morning, Jesus comes to us in our particular situation, wherever we are, wherever we're listening and watching to this, and gives us the same assurance that he gave Thomas. He says to us, examine the evidence hear from the eyewitnesses in the Gospels, and then believe. Because when you're assured of the truthfulness of what's in the Gospels, you'll be blessed when you believe it. I wonder if you've ever wished that you could actually see, touch, and hear Jesus, to be able to sit down with him and and get his advice. If you've ever wished that, then the answer is that you can. Jesus is present with you at all times through the presence of his Holy Spirit. You can talk to him. You can listen to him. You can find his words in the Bible. Jesus Christ can be as real to you today as he was to Thomas eight days after Resurrection Sunday. Jesus comes to each one of you this morning. He comes to me this morning and says... Peace be with you. Can you hear him say that to you just now? Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Conspiracy theories can never give us peace because they never give us a complete and truthful answer. Jesus can. It's a matter of faith. Will you accept, as he says to you this morning, peace be with you. If you've accepted his peace, then I wonder how you can be a taker of that peace, a bringer of that peace to others in this coming week. I wonder if you've lost touch with someone, maybe generally. uh, Maybe you can think of someone now who you've not been in touch with for a long time. Or maybe it's somebody that you're used to being in touch with, but because we're in lockdown and isolated from each other, you've not been in touch with them for a while. I wonder if you could connect with them this week. Maybe pick up the phone or send a text or an email or write them a card or something like that and take the opportunity to say to them, peace be with you. Hand on the peace that you have been given. Renew connection with them and do that in these coming days. We're going to sing together again from heaven you came, helpless babe. And as we do, I invite you to to think in your mind's eye, to imagine in your mind's eye reaching out to Jesus, touching him, seeing his wounds in his nail-scarred hands and in his side, and just thanking him for his sacrifice. Sense his peace as we sing this song together.